whole lot of ground to cover. Um, a boy, for people affected by, by Gabriel, um, say we're not a, a full service weather channel, um, but you need to keep an eye on the weather uh, uh, over the weekend. Uh, and heavy rain warnings, geez, it just doesn't stop, does it, unfortunately? And I guess what to do about that, the weather or climate change or whatever you want to call it, the fact is we've had a very uh, clear example that severe weather events uh, are causing us real, real problems, causing uh, individuals in our infrastructure massive problems. So what's the answer to that? Do we stop uh, drinking milk and eating meat? And do we try and save the planet one carbon credit at a time? Or do we take a more practical and pragmatic approach? Is the climate change, and I use the word advisedly, crisis, got to get into uh, real-time, real-world responses to the threat we face or some virtue-signalling, um, global back-slapping uh, set of protocols designed to make li the liberal left and the woke feel good? Have we reached a turning point in de dealing with climate? Uh, I seem to think we have, and I think others are saying we have, and one of those who was talking about this is the leader of the ACT Party, David Seymour, who made some pretty uh, passionate um, observations in Parliament this week, and he joins us now to discuss what the right response, and I guess medium to long term, is to an event like um, subtropical storm, former cyclone Gabriel. Uh, David, thanks for joining us. Uh, good morning to you. Welcome to the platform again. Good morning, Sean. It's nice to be here. All right. Do you think there's much point arguing over whether what we are seeing and what we're dealing with, you know, in the far north, uh, in Coromandel, in uh, Hawke's Bay, uh, areas of the Bay of Plenty, is there any point in arguing whether that's because, you know, we farm meat or because uh, we drive cars? Is there much point in, in having that discussion right now? Well, could I just start by saying it's been real interesting this week, uh, the media asking politicians, do you believe in climate change? Um, it's not a religion. It's not about belief. The question they should ask is, do you understand it? Uh, and once you start talking about how much you understand it, well, a lot of Green MPs, none of whom have studied science past high school, uh, don't seem to understand it, uh, and we're paying a price for that multiple prices. Well, isn't the truth, David, so it I, has become a religion. It well, has become an article. Are. There are articles of faith on the woke left that include climate change or man-made climate yeah, change. Yeah, that's why, that's why they ask if you believe it to see if you're, you know, part of the initiated. But what, what, what I would say to your, your question is that I have no doubt that the climate's changing. It would be strange if it had suddenly stopped now. Uh, and I think reasonable people can say that uh, you know, humans have uh, emitted through various activities uh, gases that will accelerate it because there's more of those gases in the atmosphere and they trap heat. Well, that much is true. Um, but understanding that doesn't actually get you very far. Uh, the question is for those people who have lost everything, those people whose orchards, you know, now are, are kind of ruined and they're going to have to decide whether to recapitalise at great expense and then get no revenue for four years as they bring new trees to bearing fruit. The question for, for people in situations like that uh, is what is the most effective policies for New Zealanders right now? And I can tell you what it's not. Um, the idea that New Zealand sacrificing a few cows, and there's that religious overtone you hear from them, yeah. Uh, the idea that banning oil and gas exploration, which probably increased emissions, or the idea that charging people who buy utes and giving some of the money to people who are buying a Tesla, um, none of that has worked to reduce emissions. And even if it did, uh, it would not do anything in comparison with what the rest of the world has done to increase their emissions. And the simple truth is, that there are billions of very poor people in the world who are thankfully starting to develop economically and lift themselves out of poverty. 
They will burn fossil fuels to make sure that their children are not malnourished, just as any person listening to this show uh, would do to make sure a child is not malnourished. So given that reality, uh, the question is, what should New Zealand do? And I think this flood uh, has taught a few lessons. Uh, one is that the Greens don't get it. Um, you know, James Shaw has been flailing around all week, indignantly blaming everybody but himself. He's been the climate change minister for the last five years. The things that have worked, and I've seen this in the Epsom electorate across Auckland and down in Hawke's Bay, uh, is that when you invest in the right infrastructure to get the flood waters away from your house, uh, then you can be okay. Uh, however, so long as our strategy is to spend a whole lot of money on things that barely reduce New Zealand's emissions and do nothing in comparison with the increase of emissions elsewhere, uh, then we are going to keep suffering uh, serious risks, regardless of what you may think uh, the true cause of it oh, is. Oh, God, but we've got to, you know, we've got to deliver on our promises at the Paris Accord, David. Well, that, of course, has been the, the Labour and Green and New Zealand first commitment. I mean, all three of those parties uh, signed up to the Zero Carbon Act, uh, saw us sign up to uh, the Paris Accord. And, of course, now part of that is that New Zealand must send money offshore in order uh, to mitigate climate change. And just remember, that's New Zealand first, uh, that's the Greens, uh, and that's Labour. They are the parties and you've that signed say, up to that over the last five Given years. his ordering of, of Maureen Pugh to go under, undergo some sort of re-education programme... Chris Luxon seems to be uh, bending that way as well. Well, and this is why I encourage people to support ACT, because you know, one of the things I'm worried about is that <laughs> Labor win a third term. Uh, but the other thing I'm worried about is that uh, ACT and National get enough votes, um, but the Greens do well too, and the National Party signs a side deal uh, with the Greens. And people say, that, so that'll, that'll never happen, it'll never happen. But just remember, you go back to 2008, Act and National together had a majority, but John Key signed a side deal with the Maori Party, and that's how we got, for example, um, the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People. Uh, the National Party and the Maori Party had a majority separate from the majority they had with Act. So that's why it's important to make sure that Act is big enough that National only has the option of governing with ACT. If we can ensure that, uh, then I think we can actually put some pressure on them to walk back some of the loopy policies they've indulged in. Um, but if they have a side deal with the Greens, and I see Chris Luxon, I see James Shaw, they're, they're very, very friendly, uh, then you know we're going to end up uh, with a situation where actually the policy largely carries on. So, you know, it is essential to push back the Zero Carbon Act. It hasn't worked. Start focusing on ad adaptation. OK, uh, so, so if we're not going to sing... Climate change policy yeah. work for New Zealand. So if little old New Zealand is going to pivot, we're not going to sit like King Canute trying to hold back the tide when we, we, you know, we contribute such a minuscule amount to global emissions. Um and whether or not the science on that is borne out, and of course the predictions of global warming by the IPC, the IPCC themselves have been drastically reduced, uh, their projections over the next 100 years. So does that mean we really, if we're going to deal with the consequences of severe weather, let's put it that broadly, does that mean we can stop turning, you know, productive arable farmland into forest plantations, does that mean we can abandon the ETS, uh, stop or, or stop plans to tax our farmers and our productive sector in order to meet uh, weird a, a, and slightly theoretical uh, international obligations? Is that what you're advocating, that we really, that, that if you like, climate change response begins right at home? Well, there's at least four questions there. Let me try and go through as fast as possible. Look, first of all... Um, Don't you know, rush, we've got tons of time, David. <laughs> the, the subsidies for pine trees were always stupid, and that actually goes back, if you think about it, to Shane Jones, a billion trees. Mm. Um, Subsidising pine trees all over the country has been crazy. 
Uh, if people want to cut down their or, or plant trees on their land act, will always be the first to support your property rights. But the government mm. subsidising them was crazy. And I suspect that some of those pine trees that ended up washing down the river and taking up bridges uh, were ones that the government subsidised to be there. Uh, so that's the first thing. The second question about should the government tax farmers? Uh, well, obviously not. I mean, even if you think it's critical to reduce emissions, then taxing the most efficient farmers in the world so that all of those people I talked about, poor people growing up in Africa and India and Southeast Asia, can get their protein from less efficient farmers who emit more than New Zealand farmers would be totally counterproductive. And that's before you consider the fact it puts those farmers out of business and puts them in a position where the best option they have uh, is to plant pine trees. And, you know, the, 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 the analysis from the government itself says a 20% reduction in sheep and beef. What have those people done to deserve to be put out of business, especially when it's probably going to mean that less efficient farmers elsewhere in the world mm. produce the same food? And so whether or not, yeah, we yeah. should not be... And whether yeah, or not their yeah, carbon yeah. sink forests, um, the bloody slash has to be dealt with in forestry. Uh, but I note that a lot of that slash wasn't dealt with or burnt off due to ob objections by environmentalists worried about climate well, change. Yeah, and, and that's where you need a practical approach. I mean, I suspect that even just health and safety law has made it harder to deal with those issues. Uh, then, and, and, and environmental objections to burn off has made it harder to deal with slash than it would otherwise be. But you're right, regardless of climate policy, there'll always be trees, there'll always be forestry, and that problem does need to be solved separately. I just make the point that I've contributed to it. The other question you asked about was about the Emissions Trading Scheme, or ETS. Uh, I think New Zealand should have an emissions trading scheme. Uh, we shouldn't have all of the subsidies and interventions and government getting in deciding what sort of cooker you can have if you build a new restaurant and trying to tell you how to build your house. So, you know, we don't need any of that. What New Zealand should have is an emissions trading scheme which caps the n uh, number of carbon credits and the amount of emissions, not with some goal that may or may not be reached. It should just be capped at the same level as our major trading partners. And we say, look, you know, if our, if our trading partners want to reduce their emissions, then New Zealand will follow them all the way down. Uh, but if they don't, uh, we're not going to carry on pursuing some sort of objective that they won't, like some Japanese soldier standing on an island 30 years after the war has ended, because that is suicidal for New Zealand. So keep the ETS, remove all the crazy subsidies and, and, and regulations that this government has pursued under the Zero Carbon Act, um, and then once we've done that, uh, we'll, we'll have a price and we'll be able to say to the world, we're doing our bit, how about you? Because, mm. And I think this is important because as a trading nation, uh, we can't afford to give our partners, consumers over, overseas who are worried about this stuff and the governments who control access to those consumers, we can't afford to give them an excuse. Not to buy uh, our to, stuff. To, not, not to buy New Zealand stuff. So, yeah. yes, have an ETS. Yes, keep tight to our trading partners, uh, but, but make it so much simpler. Um, you know, if you, if you buy stuff that's carbon intensive, then you'll pay more ETS fees. If you don't, you won't. And, and that's, that's how an emissions trading scheme works to reduce emissions over time. But it needn't be anywhere near as interventionist as what we have now. Yeah. David, in the more immediate aftermath of Gabriel, um, and I was really thinking about this last night and I was engaged on social media with some of the usual um, suspects, as it were. Um, Why do you do it to yourself? Ah, uh, well, you know, I've got to know what's going on. I've got to connect with the people and they come for me anyway. Um, but it seems to me that we've got all these reports of this massive gang crime wave. Oh, I'm going to be brutally frank. I can't find it. And the people who say it's happened, it's still friends of friends of friends, and, and they're the same suspects in terms of their social media circles as those who said, you know, who are into the World Economic Forum um, and Klaus Schwab and all that rubbish. And we also look, and this is probably the most disgusting pieces, and I don't call it disinformation, I call it bullshit. There's a rumour going round that some defence helicopter pilot has seen hundreds of bodies floating in a river somewhere that there are two emergency morgues filled to overflowing and the government is suppressing all this information. 
No, I read through the stuff. Oh, I heard it from a friend of a friend or I've heard a phone message from someone in defence to someone else. And I've said to all these people, you got any real evidence? Uh, you want to put your name to it? Come and talk to me. Uh, I think it's incredibly disrespectful and it puts the government in a difficult position because if you say there's no cover-up, everyone will say that's because there's a cover-up. What a cover-up we would say. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah oh, know, that's right. Yeah, conspir- you know, someone who's doing conspiracy, of mm. course they'll lie to you. Uh, and I hate to say it, but I in some ways have seen the issue that, you know, people like the Disinformation Project are dealing with. Um, do you believe that the government has been slack on on some strange gang crime wave in the wake of Gabriel? And do you have any evidence to suggest that the government is aware that there's a much higher death toll and it's a huge disaster, but they're keeping that from the people of New Zealand? OK, well, well, let's just deal with the second one first. Um, when I hear information like this, I always at least give it a chance because, you know, you've got to listen to people and, and maybe it's true. But also very rapidly start asking real basic questions. Mm. Like, if this was true, what else would have to be true? So yeah. we're saying that somewhere in Hawke's Bay there is a morgue with dozens or even hundreds of bodies and they've been there presumably for you know nearly a week, over a week now, Uh, And somehow all of these everyday Kiwis in a wide variety of jobs, all the people in the police force, all the people in the military, all the journalists who are on the ground there, that no, I mean, bear in mind, this would be a huge story that would make a journalist's career if they could break it. Yeah. Um, Well, it's been reported in the Daily Telegraph or the Daily Examiner or some, some overseas British paper. Yeah, well, anyone can start a website now. It's far easier than some people may realise. Um, and, and so speak for yourself, want. David. Um. <laughs> well, we've X had a website since 1996. We were the first political party to have a website um, a long time before the platform's website came along, I might add. All right. Um, but in any, in any event, you know, I just ask people, is it plausible that that's happening and, and somehow nobody is talking about it any more than a couple of obscure websites? It's, it's just not plausible. Yeah. So that, that's the first question. Well, they're also the yourself. same group of people who said this guy, Graham Phillip, was a political prisoner. Uh, and I just look into the okay. same, you know, yeah. Okay, so I you're miss, saying miss, no, you don't believe theory. you don't believe no, that. I, no, I don't, because because you know, and this is the thing: once you start dealing with government, it, it's just mostly a, a whole lot of salt of the earth, everyday Kiwis who work in a government job. It's it's your police, uh, it's your, your health people, um, it's your civil defence. So it's just not plausible that, that all of those people are involved in a giant cover-up and, yep. and nobody's found out and made, done a major story on it. Yeah. On, the, on the violence and crime, I think it's more mixed. I'll tell you what I do know is that I've been down to Hawke's Bay in the last week. Uh, I met with the very impressive mayor of uh, Napier, Kirsten Wise. I met with her deputy. Um, I met with another one of her councillors, Sally Crown. Um, and... I believe when she goes on the radio and says people don't feel safe, the police are not visible, we need help and support, when, when she says yeah, that... Yeah, but not feeling safe isn't a crime wave. That's a feeling. Well, I, but hang on a second. The, the opportunity here was for the government to acknowledge that uh, and actually put some troops on the ground under the Defence Act and say, right, we're here, everything's secure, don't worry about security, get on with the enormous other challenges uh, that you face as a community. What the government said instead was, no, 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 you're delusional, you're wrong, it's not right. And I think that talking down to people that way was a huge mistake and inconsistent uh, with the government's usual approach that they believe people who are fearful and oppressed. Uh, In this case, they showed that they don't believe people at all. They go on the radio and gaslight them and say you shouldn't be... Yeah, but equally, David, there is no evidence, and the Gisborne Mayor's come out today, said there's no evidence of an uptick in crime in East Cape Gisborne. It is just fear. It's a feeling. And I don't know if... uh, Fear's a terrible motivator. Uh, I mean, you know, are we dealing in feelings or facts here when when we're allocating limited resources? 
Well, first of all, the, the, the resources aren't limited. The reason that the Defence Act allows uh, Defence Force personnel to be deployed under the supervision, supervision of constables is so that there are more resources. That's the option that the government had. Uh, second of all, uh, you know, you may think that you know how people feel in a crisis is not that important, but actually providing reassurance uh, is something very important the government could have done. Uh, instead, uh, they decided to tell them that their concerns weren't valid uh, and they should bugger off. And, and I don't think that that is the kind of leadership that's required in a crisis. I think they've made a big mistake there. All right. Look, finally, and thank you for answering all those questions on those issues. I know it was a fairly broad ranging. I've had a number of texts from people, and I know we briefed your people on it and want your opinion on it. The poetry to be dramatised of a woman who is a uh, member of the New Zealand Order of Merit. Her name is Tusiata Avia. Um, and Tusi, we, we played a poem that actually was published on Stuff as well. We, we played a poem yesterday she wrote about James Cook, um, which fundamentally paints a picture, and I would say encourages a young uh, Pacific Island woman to hunt down white men and kill them. Uh, I don't know if you're aware. Have you heard the poem yet or not, or read, read the text, David? I don't know. I think I've heard about this person, and, and, and she's written about how she loves, you, you know, how brown people squirm and white... Uh, sorry, brown people laugh and white people squirm. And, and James, it's just, it's just, we're James, we're going to F you up. We're going to hunt you down. Any of your descendants, uh, you know, any iteration of you, we're going to stick you. We're going to F you up for good. Um, that mm. has been performed at the, new, at the Auckland Arts Festival as, and it's been adapted into a play and others of her work. Um, mm. It has been funded but, entirely through government funds through a thing called Foundation North, which is, uh, and its trust members are appointed by the Minister of Finance and it's administered by Internal Affairs and it's run on the proceeds of the sale of the public share in the Auckland Savings Bank. And, of course, Creative New Zealand are up into it up to their eyeballs. So, uh, look, everyone who's heard it, everyone who's heard it, uh, and thousands of people have now say it's hate speech, even under the current laws, David. I'm not suggesting she be banned, but, but I'm raising the question. It, it isn't just art. It, it's absolute provocation to violence. And do you think taxpayers' funds or government funds should be allocated and should be supporting art like that? Well, first of all, I, I haven't heard the specific poem. Mm. Uh, second of all, when you say you believe in free speech, that, that's absolute. Yeah, uh, so yep. I, I agree in free speech, I, but is, I don't agree in free yep. money. Yep, so, so first of all, here, here's how you deal with it. Uh, this is a modern, multi-ethnic, liberal democracy based on universal human rights and one five millionth of the opportunity this country has to offer for each and every person, regardless of race. And if this woman is saying what well, the kinds of things that you describe her as saying, then she's a complete idiot and she should be laughed out of town and ignored exactly the way uh, that she deserves to be. Um, that's how you deal with it. And but she's on. not I being, mean, David, really... she's being supported by various government agencies. She has been given a New Zealand Order of Merit and essentially a government-funded arts festival is, a festival is backing here and stuff in the mainstream media are essentially yeah, lionising here. Sean, I got, I got that. I got mm. that. The, the second issue is that the way that arts funding is being done is increasingly politicised and what a new government needs to do is have a look at the appointments and start appointing people that believe in the values I just described. Um, but ultimately, you've got to support free speech, you've got to, you've got to support artistic freedom, uh, rather than try and do what the other side do all the time and cancel and so on. Yeah, and we're not so, trying to yeah. cancel anyone. We're, we're, we're directing people to write and express their freedom of speech and their views on art to the Auckland Festival and to Creative New Zealand and to their local MP. That's freedom of speech right there, David, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Mm. And I think if people feel that way, then they should certainly criticise them because, you know, the answer uh, to free speech is actually more speech. More, yeah, uh, that's but, right. You know, yeah. the, the, this, the, the, we, we need to be very careful that we don't end up doing exactly mm. what the other side do and end up worse off uh, as a result. 
And when it comes to government funding, I mean, it's always a challenge, isn't it? Because you don't want politicians to get involved in deciding what sort of art gets funded. Um, but politicians do appoint the boards of these organisations yeah. that make the grants. And I suspect, I just look back at the, you know, I think I think Creative New Zealand have just funded their third Chloe Swarbrick geography political career. Um, I think I think it's time uh, to put some people on those boards who are committed to developing uh, New Zealand's art and heritage uh, as, as a as a national project, not a, not a national party, but a nationwide project, um, mm. rather than. Uh, trying to get involved heavy-handed and decide, you know, politicians are going to fund that, not yeah. fund that. There's, there's lots of countries where politicians have that sort of control, but I wouldn't want to live in them. Yeah. Hey, David, thank you very much indeed uh, for your time this morning and for covering so yeah, much ground no problem, with us. Sean. Uh, take it easy. Great to see you. That is uh, David Seymour, leader of the ACT Party.